until close to the end of the conference. I want to talk to you about the Big Ten approach to transforming scholarly communications we have within the University of California. And I want to start with a little bit of story time here. In the fall of uh, 2018, I moderated a conference called uh, that was called Community Pathways to Open Access. Uh, we've got one of the lead organizers sitting right there. Um, it was a wonderful event put on by the UC Libraries, inviting everybody to uh, sh have a big conversation about how to invest in open access and what kind of pathways were open to us. And on the morning of the second day of the conference, my then six-year-old daughter drew this cat. And we incorporated it into the kickoff for the second day of the conference because we wanted people to really embrace this idea of the many pathways, just like my daughter embraced the idea that she had a whole lot of colors she could use. And we also wanted people to embrace the idea that, you know, wherever you start might not be where you wind up. If you look at this carefully, she clearly started thinking that she was going to be sort of doing something, that it was her blue phase, right? She was in her blue phase. But then the closer she got to the tail, it was more like, well, now I'm in my green phase. Well, now I'm going to use yellow and orange, too. And that's part of the key message here that I want to send to you in this keynote today that there are many pathways to open access, we should embrace and celebrate them all, and that where you start might not be where you wind up, and that that's okay, and be in it for the journey. Um, so congratulations to uh, all those of you who are in scholarly communications. It's an awesome time to be in scholarly communications, as this conference has proven. Um, it's just such great and meaningful work. And if you're anything like me, you want to get up every morning and be fired up about what you do. And you want to go to work and feel like you're making a real difference, not just to your library or your university. You want to feel like you're making a real difference for the big enterprise of science and for discovery and for progress of humanity. And I think our the way we have this conversation about open access and scholarly communication contributes immensely to all of that. And I have something here that comes from a very, very different political moment, I realize, uh, but don't get too jarred by that. This is uh, then Vice President Joe Biden uh, speaking in front of a crowd of cancer researchers. And basically what he's saying is, can you imagine what we could get done if this research weren't paywalled? Um, and of course, he's absolutely right. Cancer research can go a lot further when the research isn't behind a paywall. And that was exactly his point. And I think that is true in any field of endeavor. When the information is openly accessible, um, more stuff gets done and researchers can build on each other's work. And we as society can tackle the big challenges we face. And that's what makes me get out of bed every morning. It's also good news that um, there's a lot of job security for all of us in the room because uh, there's a good bit of room for improvement here. If you look at this slide, uh, courtesy of um, our colleagues and friends from Impact Story, uh, you can see that gray still dominates the landscape and gray, of course, is closed. So we've got a good bit of uh, room for improvement and work cut out for ourselves. And I think Progress always requires coalition. And in this case, it doesn't require one coalition. It requires many different coalitions. And it's, I think, important for all of us to realize that as we move forward, um, having conversations that pit one kind of coalition against the other and sort of pit all of us who are on the right side of history against each other is not the productive way to move forward. So I humbly suggest that we should not proceed in that way. And, you know, I have gold, green, and infrastructure up here just as sort of random examplars. There's many, many different, many, many other approaches and many other projects we are all collectively engaging in as a community. That it's, those aren't pitted against each other. Those are synergistic and can work together. And that's part of what I want to prove to you in this talk today. So we've learned that the hard way at the University of California. The University of California is tremendously diverse. Uh, you've got some numbers up here. The one I want to focus on here is that we have 23,000 faculty members, and we've got uh, 10 libraries on campuses, and we've got the California Digital Library as the 11th library. 
And both our faculty as well as our librarians are choke full of ideas for how they want to advance open access. And we as a system could have now chosen to try to funnel that energy into a very narrow open access lane and try to corral everybody. And if we had done that, we would have killed off a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy. So we decided not to do that. We decided to deeply and wholeheartedly embrace the many pathways to open access that are available to us and harness that amazing energy we have. And at the center of that journey within the UC uh, is not the library, it's really the faculty. Uh, I know that um, all of you who were here last year had the pleasure of hearing Rich Schneider talk about this Declaration of Rights and Principles to Transform Scholarly Communication. Who all heard that talk from Rich? Less of you than I thought. Um, well, Rich was here and I heard it created quite a stir. Basically, these are high-level principles, high-level values that the faculty articulated and our Academic Senate Library Faculty Committee then ratified that talk about what our faculty want to see. Uh, and this was published in 2018. At the same time, um, our system wide, our UC libraries worked on a document called The Pathways to Open Access. And that document really lays out what are all the different paths we have available to ourselves and that we could invest in in order to make progress on this big, big project of getting all of the research openly available. And if you want to think about it this way, the relationship between these two documents is that one, one is principles and values and the other document is really the very practical and tactical next steps we can all take in order to move those principles and values forward. California Digital Library at the UC is sort of a, a hub for collaboration and system-wide action. And uh, so it won't be surprising to you that we, and as part of our strategic vision, also put a large emphasis on open scholarship and open access because we think it, if freely available research informs ever more potent responses to real world challenges, just think back to the cancer example, and that moving forward with open access enables the University of California to produce a measurable impact that will be valued by the state, the nation, and the world. So this is also about what is a research university and a public university good for these days, and how can it be relevant to, um, to the people of the state and to the nation. And this is one of the principal ways in which we can be relevant if our research translates into real life advances. So now that you have this context, now that you know that I hug all of the different approaches to open access, I wanna focus with you on one particular path to open access that I've invested myself personally very heavily in recently, which is publisher negotiations for transformative agreements. And um, I have this fleeting suspicion that one of the reasons why I was asked to give this keynote is that I am on the uh, negotiating team that walked away from Elsevier on February 28th of 2019 and created quite a stir that way. I wanna talk to you about what I feel is important about the stance we took, why we did what we did, and where we find ourselves today. And in order to start that conversation with you, I wanna focus on the why, and I'm gonna give somebody else a voice here, somebody rather important, uh, one of the regions of the University of California. In July, uh, UC Berkeley librarian Jeff Mackey Mason and I myself went to the regions to explain to them what happened here and uh, what we're trying to achieve with uh, transformative agreements with publishers and Regent Oakley asked us a very pointed question after we were done presenting to them. And if you listen closely, you'll realize that this is actually not a question. This is actually a statement. So take a listen. Interestingly enough, this is a question I've been getting as I talk to folks uh, who know that I'm on the board. and. You know, from the taxpayer perspective, from the, just the normal person on the street who believes that they are supporting research at the University of California through public funds, uh, they are dismayed that um, a, a for-profit institution is holding that research ransom. Um, uh, you know, how would, 
help me explain to the normal person how that can happen. These are public dollars going into a public university. Research is, knowledge is being created, and we can't share that with the general public without paying for it. And I will always remember Jeff's response to this. Jeff basically looked at him, took a moment's pause, and said, Regent Oakley, we share your dismay. Um, and that was the perfect response. So this is, sorry. This is, that was the why from sort of a public research university perspective. Uh, this is the why from a financial perspective. Today, the UC libraries are paying, today the University of California is paying publishers with the left hand and we're paying them with the right hand. With the left hand, our libraries are paying $40 million each year for our system-wide licenses. Those are sort of the bedrock of access that every single uh, faculty member and student, no matter where in the UC they are, enjoys. And then with the right hand, our authors are paying $10 million to publish open access because they're fired up about open access. And of course, that money comes from funders, uh, by and large, and other research funds. So all of that creates a tremendous revenue stream for the publisher. Um, and is that spend happens without any relationship to one another. Actually, most, most universities don't even know what their faculty spend uh, themselves on on these open access fees. So the other thing that's important to understand here, you all know that uh, on the subscription side, our costs go up every year and they go up tremendously, well-trodden story. Uh, when we look at the last three years of data in terms of our author spend, year after year, our authors spend 15 to 20% more on APCs. Again, utterly uncontrolled spend. Um, and what is all of that buying us? 15% of open access. That's wrong and it's completely unsustainable. So, sorry, this is a bit buggy here. Instead of living in that world, this is the world we actually want to live in, where these funding streams are coming together and are uh, controlled, and where our authors are in the middle of the equations where our authors trigger the spending and the money follows our authors. And that is what we have been negotiating for. So in that model, uh, there's some money flowing from funders that then authors trigger, and there's money flowing from libraries that also our authors trigger by where they want to publish, where they want to place their research. Ultimately, both of these streams then come together and they're combined and regulated through a single con, con a contract, a, a transformative agreement, and within that transformative agreement, the total cost is capped, um, and you might have sort of a, a safe passage corridor for both parties that says, well, if publishing volume is up, maybe we'll pay you 2% more. If publishing volume is down, we'll pay you 2% less. That creates sort of predictability for both pub parties, for the publisher as well as for the library. What that then ultimately looks like for a faculty member is when they have an accepted manuscript right off the bat, there's a choice. Uh, they can either say like, I don't want to participate in this and publish closed access. We don't know why they would do that. Or they can go on the open access lane. If they're on that lane, then um, they get a library subvention. Every, every author gets a library subvention that they can then um, sub, uh, that they can then supplement with their grants if they have grants and that then pays for their open access publication. If they don't have a grant, no problem, the library pays in full. So no faculty member will be left behind. So it creates a situation where basically every faculty member wins. Those who are already publishing open access and are spending those $10 million, those $10 million will uh, see their costs decrease because they get a library subvention. Those who haven't been able to publish open access to date uh, will be able to participate in that for the first time because the library's got your back. Uh, we will pay the full costs. And those who really don't want anything to do with any of this, well, they can opt out. We respect their academic freedom. So we think this is a really good model. We think it's good for the academy because it's mission aligned for a public research university um, to ensure that its authors can publish open access. We think it's good for faculty, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, you all know that. When, when research is open access, there's increased readership and there's increased impact for that research. We also think it's good for library budgets because now those research funds, 
uh, those funds that come largely from funders actually defray the library budget instead of being this additional revenue stream on the other side of the equation that just fills the coffers of, of the publisher. And we think this is ultimately really good for the publishing ecosystem because our authors now become economic actors. They are squarely in the middle of this. They call the shots. Wherever they go, the money flows. And ultimately, that'll then mean that there will be um, economic pressures on downward pressures on the cost to publish because our, the publishers are competing for authors. They're not competing for libraries. And the authors are now calling the shots. So this is the journey we're on. Today we're in this unmanaged, escalating open access economy where there's subscriptions and there's APCs and they're funded and paid for separately without any relationship between them. And it creates this massive revenue stream to the publishers. Tomorrow, or sooner hopefully, we want to be in uh, these transitional open access agreements where both those Streams of funding are covered by a single transformative agreement where one type of fee is offset by the other. We don't have any, any more double dipping, and we finally understand the total cost to the university, and we can control that cost. And then eventually, if we're successful, subscription payments largely disappear from this picture. Uh, funding gets reallocated to open access support, and that, again, can take many different forms. It doesn't have to be APCs. Uh, it can also be other funding models. So you all know that it didn't quite work out that way with Elsevier. Um, the sort of final end game of all of that has been pretty well documented publicly, you know, what our final offer to them was, what their final offer to us was, why we pulled the trigger in February 28th. I put some links up here for you uh, in case you want to read up on that. I don't really want to talk about that too much other than to say that there was a lot of misinformation uh, from uh, Elsevier's side about what truly happened, so we uh, also crafted a fact check document to refute some of their statements, and we had a lot of fun with this, and it also got a lot of play on social media, so check that out if you're interested in that as well. Now, in July, on July 12th, uh, 2019, so seven months after the contract lapsed, um, Five months after we walked away from the negotiation table, Elsevier finally cut off our access, which is their right to do. And um, at that moment in time, it's very important to point out that cutting off access in this instance means we only lost access to 2019 content. We have back files for most of the other Elsevier content. So 2019 content is really what we're concerned about and what we lost access to. Now here are the, the interlibrary loan statistics for the system, for the UC system, since the day we lost access. And the blue line here is our overall ILL volume. So this is, this is the total ILL volume. You see it's a line that's slowly ticking up and then there's a big jump. The big jump is there because um, it's the middle of September and schools are back in session. Uh, that's, that accounts for that jump. The orange line at the bottom here is basically the Elsevier queue. Those are the requests we're getting uh, because our faculty and students don't have access to that 2019 Elsevier content anymore. And you can see that's a pretty flat line. You know, that didn't change all that much. And currently it's at about a little under 500 articles a week. So the good news here is that that is easily manageable. This has not created a crisis in our libraries, far from it. Um, when we sort of worked our way towards getting ourselves into this situation, of course, we were rather curious and we were trying to forecast what we needed to expect um, if our access were cut off. So we were trying to forecast that, and I want to walk you through some of these numbers here. Um, I have numbers from three months, basically. Um, from January through March that I'm then going to compare and contrast to what actually happened. So all downloads in January and March, uh, from January through March, were about 1 million, uh, 1.5 million downloads. But then you need to remember, we didn't lose access. We were not going to lose access to all content, only to 2019 content. So then we adjust the number for just 2019 content, and then we're looking at about a little over 200,000 uh, 200,000 downloads. 
then we looked at the literature and we realized, while there's not a, a ton of literature about this, there's some indication that uh, sort of the number of downloads translates roughly into 10% of, of, of ILL demand to the library. So we downward adjusted our forecast for what we might expect to about 20,000. Then if we look at three months from July through September of what actually happened, this is the actual demand we have faced. So it's about 4,000 uh, 4, articles that our faculty and our students are, are asking us to find on their behalf. So again, there's a good news story here. The good news is we are not drowning in work. This is utterly manageable. Um, however, there's also a, a little bit of a troubling piece to this, right? We don't quite know how faculty and students are really finding these articles now. We have some, we have some guesses about this. Um, some of those guesses involve uh, legal sources like, you know, green OA repositories, um, as well as um, asking their colleagues to send them these articles. Um, but ultimately, we just don't know how they're triaging this. And what we're worried about is that some of them might be giving up. You know, are they simply not reading that article because they can't conveniently get access to it, and so they're, they're moving on. That would be troubling to us, and so we've committed ourselves to doing some kind of a survey, some kind of activity that surfaces what are, what are our faculty and students actually doing here and how are they triaging the situation so we find out what, what burden they're actually shouldering. So at, that, at this point, you're probably, well, I just wanted to point out, so from the downloads to the actual demand we're facing, you can see this is only 2% of the actual downloads. So that's rather minor. So at this point, you're probably going to ask me, so how are your faculty doing? What, is, what are they saying about all of this? And by and large, uh, there have been very, very few complaints. Um, and I really mean very, very few complaints. We have 23,000 faculty members, and maybe we heard negative comments from, a, from, from, you know, you can count them on two fingers, two hands. So that's not, that's not a lot of negative feedback that we've received. Um, but what we did hear from them pretty clearly is that they were uh, fired up about sort of making their voices heard. And there are uh, two faculty petitions that have been launched by UC faculty uh, since the standoff with Elsevier has occurred. One of them basically saying we're going to withhold labor um, until this is resolved. The other one uh, in support of the publish and read proposal uh, the negotiation team has made to Elsevier. And then, of course, there's also a more longer standing petition called the Cost of Knowledge that a, a lot of UC faculty members signed as well. Um, I want to say that the, the library had nothing to do with any of this, right? We're not egging our faculty members on to do these petitions or to boycott Elsevier. That's really not our role here. Faculty can decide what they want to do. We are not calling for a boycott. But this is how they are self-organizing around this issue. Also, very prominently, this made rather big news. Uh, there were 30, 30, 30 faculty members who are uh, cell press um, on the editorial boards of cell press titles. And for those of you who are familiar with Elsevier's portfolio, cell press is the prestige set of titles that Elsevier has. And uh, 30 of uh, our um, faculty who are on editorial boards for those journals basically said, we are now going to suspend our editorial duties until this issue is resolved. And among those faculty members is one Nobel laureate, one person who we think of as a future Nobel laureate, and she's a neighbor of John Chadaki's, um, <laughs> and uh, a dean of a medical school. So only claim to fame. John's only claim to fame, he says. <laughs> Not true. Um, so these are very important people, um, and they've said, we want this resolved. There's another impact all of this has had, um, this failed negotiation has had, which is that I think it really opened up a space. It opened up a space for a conversation between uh, faculty, administration, and libraries about the cost of scholarly communications and our values of open access. And the tip of the iceberg of that conversation is uh, what we see as these statements of support that have been issued. Uh, since we walked away from Elsevier, 21 statements have been made by institutions or consortia, and those statements represent over 280 institutions. And these statements all read very similarly. They basically say we're making the statement in solidarity to the UC, and we support what they're doing. 
And we are now going to have our own conversations about uh, the cost of scholarly communications and our open access goals on our campus or within our community to figure out what we can do about this. Uh, so it's a, it's a powerful and potent moment uh, for uh, the open access movement. And this gives me a lot of heart that we are actually at a tipping point now where we're going to get this, uh, what looks like a rock, a, a rather round rock, up this scraggly, scraggly peak. Um, so we'll eventually wind up in this place where there are palm trees and tropical <laughs> birds and sunsets. And I really believe we are now close to this and we are close to this tipping point. And what's important to understand about this is, you know, all these statements that were made, they weren't made in support of just one sort of narrow approach. They weren't just made in support of transformative agreements. Really, this, this moment has energized all of the different pathways towards open access. Um, and I can also see this within the UC. We've redoubled efforts and feel fired up and our faculty are fired up about the many different things we are doing in order to get to open access and uh, open science. And I want to share some of those examples with you now. Um, for example, within the UC, we have not one, but two system-wide open access policies, one by the faculty and for the faculty, and one that's a presidential policy that covers our staff and students. The one covering the faculty, we're already vigorously implementing. The other one, uh, we are now starting to uh, implement, and we're on a journey there. And this entire um, standoff with Elsevier has really renewed our appreciation for green open access because we now realize that at least one of the factors that is helping keeping the ILL demand down within our libraries is precisely because all of you, thank you very much, um, have worked so hard on making uh, materials avail available in your repositories. And that is a big piece of the story and that's why we want to move further there. Just for a lark, I'm throwing up this graph because that's one of the other reasons why we're very proud of the work we're doing here. This basically shows how far UC research is going when it is uh, published in eScholarship, our open access uh, repository. Uh, UC research in green OA reaches the entire world, and it's something we're very, very proud of. eScholarship is not only our repository, it's also actually a publishing platform in its own right. We publish over 90 open access journals that are affiliated in one way or another uh, with the UC in eScholarship. And this is another pathway that now got energized uh, through the standoff with Elsevier. The team that is running eScholarship is now fielding a lot of phone calls from faculty members who say, so how can I uh, launch my own, own journal? How do, you, how, do you, how do you support that? What kind of infrastructure do we have for this? And so it redoubled our commitment and our interest in making sure that we have infrastructure we're proud of and that we can put up in front of a researcher and say, look, this is actually a viable path. If you're ready to do this, you, we can host your journal and you, you can do this in infrastructure we can all be proud of. And to that end, uh, we've, we are, we're participating in a grant um, from the Arcadia Foundation um, uh, that, is, that went to Educopia that really is focused on professionalizing uh, library publishing and connecting up different pieces of infrastructure that already exist and polishing, up, polishing them up and making them work together in ways uh, that allows not just the UC but potentially anyone in this room to provide that kind of service to their faculty members. And you can see all of the other partners on that grant named here. It's, a, it's an activity that I'm really looking forward to seeing the outcomes of. We just started here. Another thing uh, UC librarians are very involved in, first and foremost, um, uh, Rachel from uh, UC Berkeley is an activity called Transitioning Society Publications to Open Access. We realize that as we're moving in this brave new world of transformative agreements, uh, societies have a lot of questions. Society publishers have a lot of questions about how they can participate and what this means for their business model and for their future. And so there's a group of people who've come together to basically provide a consultancy service to talk to society publishers about what they can do 
uh, and, and provide them with advice from a variety of different angles about how to move forward and how to advance in this brave new world. And last but not least, uh, it's not all about publications. We're also very invested in um, publishing and making openly available uh, research data. Um, and again, this is a pathway that's also fueled by what has happened here in this negotiation with Elsevier, because I personally realized that it would be very harmful to us as a community if 10 years down the road we were in the same place with research data that we're currently finding ourselves in uh, with, with publications, meaning that research data is controlled by commercial entities who um, then um, control one of the core outputs of the academy. And so we think it's really important that alternatives to that exist. And uh, to that end, CDL has formed a partnership with a long-standing community repository, Dryad, was founded 10 years ago uh, by researchers and is now a general repository for research data. It's well known for uh, particularly for being a curated research repository where every data set gets a health check and gets curated. Um, and where high quality data sets live. And we've recently relaunched Dryad on a new and contemporary platform to make sure that it, again, can compete against uh, the other repositories that um, are provided by commercial players in this space. And now I'm gonna circle back around to transformative agreements because I sort of gave you the uh, story that sort of grabbed the headlines, which is our failure with Elsevier. Well, there's also another story here, which is an actual success. Uh, we struck, an agreement with Cambridge University Press in April of 2019 that actually instantiates everything we've asked Elsevier for. So we are doing this, and UC faculty are publishing today open access in Cambridge University Press under that transformative agreement. Um, and I want to give a big shout out to Cambridge University Press for being such a great partner on this and working with us hand in glove to uh, realize that actually instantiating these transformative agreements and making them work after you've signed the contract is a pretty heavy lift, and they've been a wonderful partner. So I am winding down here slowly but surely, and at this moment in time I wanna say one of the things we've done a lot of within the UC libraries, not just me, but a lot of us have been out there talking about this, and we've also been trying to make a lot of resources available to you as a community. Uh, one of them is what I've got up here, um, a toolkit, uh, for negotiating with scholarly journal publishers. It sort of talks about uh, both the model we're pursuing, but also uh, some other uh, lessons learned from our negotiations to date. So take a look at that if you're interested in transformative agreements in particular. I also want to say that, um, as John said, I just came, I'm coming directly from uh, the OA 2020 meeting in Berlin, and this is really a powerful path, and I was reminded of that by an announcement that, um, that uh, Hungary made uh, in that meeting, which is basically that by next year they will be 80% open access within Hungary uh, on the basis of all the transformative agreements they've struck. So this is really a fast and transformative path. So join us if that's of interest to you. If you are interested in any of the other open access paths that I talked about and you're, you, you want to know more, you want to be connected up to the people within the UC or pushing that forward, please let me know. I'm happy to connect you up um, and make sure that you have all the information you want and need. So as I'm winding down here, um, I want to say that one of the things that is particularly important that we've very diligently pursued at the UC is this coalition between the faculty and, and the library. And I would say this is a coalition that, that all of you can build and that all of you can invest in. Um, and it's been very, very powerful for us to make the faculty and their values the beating heart of that coalition and to really let them lead uh, and then put the library in service of bringing that open access vision to life and advancing our faculty's values and goals and objectives. Um, and I think Force 11 might have a role to play here as well and can play a role, you as a community. I'm really struck by 
the power the fair data principles have exerted in our space. You know, wherever I look, I see them cited. I see them pointed at as the thing that obviously all of us should do and aspire to. And perhaps the time is right to have um, a declaration of rights and principles to transform scholarly communications that sort of elevates a little bit. Um, maybe it's the time is right for Force 11 to bring together a working group of faculty members who can create such a set of principles that then give all of you within your university settings a legs up um, when you then locally want to calibrate towards these kinds of values and towards these kinds of goals. Um, so I know that some conversations about this have already started, and I just want to add my voice to encouraging you to really pursue that. I think that could be a very, very powerful thing to do and could help the, uh, the broader community uh, move forward. And uh, Rich Schneider, who is the author of, the, the, the primary author of that UC Declaration of Rights and Principles, was with me in Berlin, and I asked him about this, and he said if something like that moves forward, he'd be happy to participate. So you've got your first working group member. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and with that, all that's left for me to do is to thank you and to look at the watch and see whether we have any time for Q&A. Do we? Just um, before we take some questions, I just want to let everybody know that we are going to just uh, we're going to adjust the schedule 15 minutes. So it's already updated on the sketch. You can take a look. So we're going to do about 15, a little bit, you know, 10 minutes of Q&A, and then we'll have five minutes to change rooms, and then we'll start the next session at 4:30. So just a little logistics before we do Q&A. So, um, so we're going on first, until 4:30. Yeah, we're 4:25. Four, so we okay. Move. Yep. Cool. Uh, questions. There's one over there, one over here. There is a question up there. Hi, um, I'm Annette from UC Santa Cruz, and I'm wondering if you can go back to the slide on um, the dissemination of UC scholarship. Because I, one thing I'm curious about is just the compliance of loading articles. And I know, like, for the University of California Santa Cruz campus, this one? yeah, compliance is pretty low. So I'm just wondering um, in that process, I know, it, I, I, speaking of like faculty driven mm -hmm. or being focused on that, it, it's also, I mean, I don't know, I think this is a great slide, a great visualization. And I know that given what it looks like, what the spread looks like, that if there were more compliance, it would look even better. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So in terms of compliance, it's actually a, a, it's pretty hard for us to have very hard figures about uh, the compliance in, in, our, in our open access policy, how much the faculty are complying with their own policy, um, because we get articles that are this year's articles as well as sort of last year's articles and so on and so forth and, and articles from further back submitted to e-scholarship and it's kind of hard to tease all of that apart. Um, but overall, if you look at the total publishing volume of the UC and you hold that up against the incoming, uh, then you can see that the compliance is about 20%. So that's not massive, but it's still an at the scale of the system, it's still a lot of openly made available research that then reaches a very, very broad community. To the left, um, I had one economical question about the publication fees in closed access. Do you have any, so this is something which is often overlooked, but actually people have been paying for, publish their work long before open access and they are still continuing to do it so. Is there any quantification of that? And are, are you doing something about it? I'm not sure I quite understand the question. What, if, what, are, so what are you referring to? What are people paying so for? Are these payment, so APC payments and hybrid journals you're referring to? No. So uh, just got an email. Um, article accepted in Journal of Neuroscience. As an author, you pay 2,000 euro if you want it closed access and 4,000 if you want it open access. So page fees. Sort of stuff, yeah. Kind of, yeah. So no, we're we're we we don't we're not studying that right now. I mean, we're aware that that's happening and has historically happened, and it's happened when journals were still in print, 
and so on and so forth, but it's not something that I have particular numbers or insights on for you. A, a quick note, actually. Um, there is a Force 11 working group led by, in part, by uh, UC's, uh, UC uh, San Diego's Marianne Martone on principles. Um, but I thought what I really liked about the ones that I saw from the UC system where it might be worthwhile combining efforts is they are fairly high level about what would be involved in keeping uh, essentially scholarship fair. Um, and this is much, much more practical. Mm -hmm. And we had a talk earlier today about how we got from the data citation principles to the implementation. And so what actually might be smart is a review of the high level principles and a principles implementation group, which is what I see that as being. Yeah. And so maybe maybe that's the way to move that one forward, essentially do a principles of the scholarly commons implementation group. Thanks. I just want, can you hear me? Ah, yeah. So I just wanted to know if there's any policy that, because it's, this is wonderful, but I want to know whether there's any policy that is aligned in terms of faculty evaluations, right? Because our faculty who are uh, publishing in open access rewarded over the ones publishing in Elsevier, very high level profile papers. Has anything changed on that side? Yeah, so this is the question that invariably always comes up in these conversations, right? Has anything in terms of tenure and promotion changed? And We've talked about that for many, many years now in our community, and, and it's, uh, I am not sure that we should continue to focus on that because it's actually not under the control of the library to make any changes there. Um, the faculty need to rally, and the faculty need to make those changes. Within the UC system, there might be changes underfoot there. Our um, The chair of our Academic Senate, who also was uh, part of the delegation in Berlin, um, is very interested in looking at that and in making potentially making policy changes. But I feel like this question has often been held up as sort of an excuse for inaction within the library. And so I think it's a good question, but it's not the question that I, as a librarian, can focus on and make progress on. So I, I choose to focus on the things that I have control over and the thing I have control over is how the library spends its money. And I can leverage that towards transformation. And then I can, um, then I hope that our faculty uh, will then also mobilize and organize and make sure that their um, tenure and promotions are um, contemporary. And I think that is the one that you have yeah. Know yes. So within the UC, there is, there is some movement there. I was wondering if you have been in contact with the Norwegian negotiators with Elsevier because they also did the same thing in right after you in March 12th and then a little over a month afterwards they um, they got message that Elsevier is actually going to give in um, and so right now uh, all Norwegian research are published open access I don't know how much of a difference money wise monetarily but it's still much cheaper than than what we were paying from before. So um, I think it's the first one in the world. Um, it's a pilot uh, contract. It's going to go on for two years. So I'm thinking it's because Norway is a little country anyway, so <laughs> it won't cost them that much. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, not sure if you've been in, in con communication with the European European um, negotiators who have actually also said no to Elsevier. I think Germany and Sweden also don't have access mm -hmm. to Elsevier. So the meeting I just came from in Berlin is the meeting of the chief negotiators. So there were people there from 30 countries, uh, including Norway. Nina was there and including, well, actually, there was nobody from Sweden this time. Um, but of course, the Germans organized the meeting. And so we're in close contact with, with all of those. And what happened in, in Norway is really interesting. Um, when when you see on February 28th walked away from the negotiations, Elsevier stock price dropped by 7%. And in terms of the valuation of the company, that's billions of dollars. And uh, then Norway 
walked away a couple of weeks later and Elsevier realized that they couldn't afford any more bad news stories. And they very quickly got a call back that then acceded to their uh, proposal and they could implement a transformative agreement. And, and the Norwegians as well as the Hungarians have been very clear that part of what made that happen for them is the walk away from the UC, that that is sort of the pressure that created that situation uh, where Elsevier couldn't afford any more bad news and then they agreed to to that deal. What's also interesting about this is that I think it's part of Elsevier's strategy to focus on countries and on institutions who, where the ratio between publications and the subscription payment creates a very, very beneficial um, revenue stream for them, or a very beneficial story, I should say. You know, because as the global community, we've all said we want cost-neutral agreements with Elsevier. So if the UC strikes a cost-neutral agreement with Elsevier, per article, we're actually, our payment is going to be, would be pretty low. Uh, because we have, uh, because we are a very high publishing output. Um, Norway's Elsevier subscription was about the same level as the UC's, but they publish half of the UC. And so you can see that that's a much better deal, quote unquote, for Elsevier to make the deal there uh, than to make the deal with us. So that's that's the situation we're in right now. They're making deals with, with um, countries and institutions that have that favorable ratio, and you're going to see uh, one deal that's also like that from the U.S. announced uh, in the coming weeks as well. Thank you. One other question. I wonder to what extent are the California, or perhaps you could also reflect from OA 2020, um, where you've just been, to what extent there's also a focus not only to um, to support these transformative agreements in a budget-neutral way, but also to support other publishing models like Diamond OA, that have a very different business model. Yeah, so I will say um, within the UC, you'll see an announcement soon of an agreement with um, a society publisher that's a structured, uh, that's a transformative agreement, but it's not APC based, and it's going to be in partnership with a number of other uh, US institutions. Uh, so we're not solely focused on APC based agreements. Um, I think one of the things that I think is important to just take stock of is that the model we're proposing that brings in grant funding into the mix um, of the agreement really is in, in many ways financially more sustainable for the library than most other models I've seen. And that's one of the key, I think, the, the key factors that keeps us very interested in that specific model. But it's not an exclusive focus on it. Okay, so I think, I think that's the, all the time we have. So thank you, Gunter, for your comments. Yeah.